How are y'all doing tonight? Well, thank you for inviting me to Canada. We're all fleeing my country right now and uh, <laughs> glad to have you take us in and give us asylum and whatnot. <sighs> How many of you use Python 3? I've been waiting for that response for a long time. I work on every evening, every weekend for the last several years. Maybe it's like seven now. And I've just been waiting for a room full of people to raise their hands. How many of you use it on a commercial project? I've been waiting for that for a long time. As recently as a year ago, I'd asked that question and I'd get one person out of 100 saying that they were currently using it on a uh, commercial project. So the time has come. This is uh, uh, fantastic. How many of you think Python is awesome? Yeah, oh. well that's cool. How many of you think Python is perfect? <laughs> so what you're saying to me is I'm fired. I'm out of a job, we're closing down, we have more, no more openings. Uh, where's Brett Cannon? Brett, he just said you're fired. Where's uh, Yuri? Ah, but Python's perfect, so it doesn't need anything. Oh, oh I see how it is, okay. So I would uh, like to invite you to our uh, world, and there's several ways to participate in it. One is you can become a mutant. A mutant is, out of a room full of normal Python people, there's a handful of people who are just absolutely abnormal. And they are in a cluster analysis, they stand alone, and they denote enormous amounts of their time uh, to the language. That is one way to participate. Basically give up your entire life. I know what you're thinking. I knew someone would know what to say. I just like to do that test to see if so, no, people know the little uh, catchphrase. In fact, there must be a better way. By the way, if you want to uh, uh, follow me on Twitter, I'm at uh, Raymond H. I only tweet about Python. I did one political tweet this year. Uh, that is my only one ever. Otherwise, it's all teaching uh, Python. So currently, I've got about 24,000 people uh, uh, following, and it will keep you up to date on the events in the Python world. Thanks for inviting us uh, uh, to Canada, and thanks for this wonderful, wonderful wonderful opportunity to speak. So uh, I've, by way of introducing myself, uh, let's say I've been a core developer for a very long time. Uh, I think I am the oldest surviving active developer uh, other than uh, uh, Quido. Uh, all of uh, the greats that were there when I started have become relatively inactive. Alex Martelli, Friedrich Lund, the people who taught me. And so now it's my obligation to do for you what, uh, what they did for me. Uh, I am a Python teacher. Uh, I teach lots of engineers. I personally taught about 5,000. I have a team that's uh, gone up to about 8,500 people, about 15 trainers who train all around the world. Uh, Python is a delightful subject to uh, uh, teach. Uh, my most recent success was I had uh, worked for over a year trying to design uh, a way to make dictionaries iterate faster, preserve order to improve their space. I tried many, many, many different uh, uh, designs. Uh, I presented one several years ago. It was not met with too much enthusiasm, so I got the secret plan. I uh, talked to the people on PyPy Pi, uh, Pi Pi, uh, on IRC, got them enthusiastic about it. They went and implemented it, at which point it proved the concept, making it uh, suitable to go back into C Python. And so that'll land in uh, uh, Python uh, 3.6. I've designed, I was going to put up here all the things I've worked on, but in fact, uh, it's just all over the standard library. I've done a bunch of stuff. Why am I putting this stuff up here? Because it is the credential for everything that I'm about to tell you. Uh, what was the thing that I could uniquely give you in this presentation? I could tell you about some particular module that I worked on, but the thing that was I thought would be of most value was to give you an insight into our world, core developer uh, world. So this is stuff that uh, I've done. By the way, uh, how many of you are using uh, Python 3.5? How many of you are using Python 3.6? How many of you are using Python 3.7? <laughs> Yuri? Yeah. Brett? 
So uh, I do all of my personal work on uh, Python 3.7. I build off of the head, run off of the head every day. If this excites you, then you're a candidate for coming into a core developer world. It's not that hard. You just do a, uh, a configure and make, and you can be running Python 3.7 now, which means if there's something that you don't like, you can change it. All right, here we go. Your personal invitation to core developer world. We're hiring. Now, I've not done a whole lot of recruiting at uh, events, so I'm doing my best to simulate somebody who's doing a real hire. So, what, we are looking for diverse developers. And we're not kidding about that. Uh, I have decided that the only way that we're going to improve our diversity is if I uh, take a couple of lady developers and personally coach them every single day and nurture this developer over a long period of time. I have uh, two protégés uh, right now, two different parts of the world, one in Silicon Valley and one in uh, Israel. And I believe I just picked up another one uh, today. And my goal is to uh, coach them every single day to set aside uh, uh, bugs, uh, for them to work on when they encounter resistance in the organization to help them overcome it. Brett has devoted himself to doing this as well. Quido is on board and is running interference for them and helping to uh, make this possible. So we're actually very serious about uh, 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 diversity and we uh, hope to have our first official uh, Python female uh, core developers very, very soon. So diverse developers are wanted where you can build some software that changes the world. You can work from home. You can pick anything to work on. We have mentors, which is great. And this is the best part. I've been along, around more than the rest of these other uh, core developers, and they haven't had the full effect of doubling like I have. Every single year that I've worked in Python core development, Quido has doubled my salary. Pretty awesome. Two to the 16th power. <laughs> So you can become rich if your starting point is greater than mine. <laughs> and the best part of all, unlike other work environments, there is no limit on how many hours you can contribute. You can work as hard and as long as you want. Are you looking forward to it? All right. Okay, what's it? Here's what we need. I think... The core developers we have now are very atypical users. We have some core developers who work strictly on the C internals, and I believe they have never met a user in their entire life. That doesn't mean that they're not good at what they do, but they haven't met users. We have core developers who are good at documentation, but terrible at uh, API design. We have uh, core developers who are really good at uh, helping us move forward with our tooling, uh, getting us set up with continuous integration, writing developer guides, that sort of thing. But these uh, sort of skills are atypical. They are not representative of the skills in this room. What Core development needs now is input from people like you, who are actually much more typical, input from actual real users. In fact, the further along we've gotten in our careers, core developers, the more removed we've become from our day-to-day -day users. Uh, many of the core developers have never taught a, uh, a high school class full of uh, Python users. Many of them never taught a university class. Uh, many of them uh, are interested in web computing, but uh, are web development and have never done any scientific computing. Uh, where's uh, uh, James? Okay, how'd the num focus talk go today? That is awesome. If you didn't see James No Focus talk, you should go take a look at it on a, a video. He is a representative and emissary from a very important part of our world, and almost no core developer has been into that world. There is a giant segment of uh, the Python community uh, that has no representation amongst the core developers. In other words, we need skill sets from our users, people who do stuff quite different from what we do. You have folks who work at Dropbox and uh, Rackspace and Canonical, and they have needs that are shaped by the needs of their organization, but it might be quite far removed from yours. We, we can value your, expect, uh, your perspective. So we need your feedback, your perspective, particularly on usability for uh, uh, new features. If you have technical expertise in some area, we would love to uh, uh, have it. 
and have you contribute to our thinking because it is shockingly difficult to design APIs for use by other people if you have never stepped foot in their shoes, if uh, you don't know what it is that you're uh, that they're going to try and do with your tools. It is incredibly easy to write bad APIs. Language design is different from almost every other project you've worked on. On other projects, you typically know what it is you're trying to do at the outset and you know who your users are. Language design, some of our uh, users pro might not even have been born yet. We have to anticipate what their uh, requirements are. Uh, this may be one of the first talks that I give where it's possible there's somebody in this room who wasn't born when I started contributing uh, to uh, uh, Python. So that's not really an exaggeration. There we go. How old are you, sir? 14 which is fantastic. Thank you for uh, coming to the uh, uh, conference. Uh, we have had very good success with uh, young people. Oh, even, you're 12. <laughs> you remind me of. I tried a session at a PyCon in UK years ago where I did blind code review. People just brought in code, popped it up on the screen, and I'd look at it, and I would tell them what, uh, what I would see. And a person had a performance problem with star argument unpacking, feeding a zip in, uh, iter tool zip, into the arg unpacking. So I explained what the performance problem was and how to uh, work around it. And there was somebody your age in that group who said something that still blows, blows me away. He said, oh, thank you. I have that problem all the time. <laughs> like, how does a 12-year-old have that problem all the time? <laughs> Thank you for coming to the conference. It might not be that long before you're here on a, a stage. I went to a conference once where uh, they set up uh, the podium, then they set up a uh, stool for a person to uh, stand on, and that person came up and was a little bit younger than you and stood up and gave a talk about their first pie game project. Might not be long. Till you're on stage, this invitation goes out to you as well. Welcome. All right. Uh, this is something very useful you can do, exploring APIs. Our world of core developers are full of people who like to build things. We like to make patches. We like to implement things. Unfortunately, that is the least important part of what we do. API design and usability is the most important part, and you can help us right there. Also, we don't have a whole lot of need for people contributing patches. That's not entirely true. It'd be nice to have some patches here and there. But in fact, we are somewhat unbalanced in that we have more patches than we have time to uh, review them. I have a lot of things that I would like to do in the core, but I spend a substantial amount of time reading other people's uh, patches, which is something that I might not be interested in what uh, uh, they're doing, but someone has to review their patch and take it uh, off, off forward or uh, channel it in the right uh, direction. You can help quite a bit in that. If you want to donate some time reviewing other people's packages, uh, uh, submissions, that would be a fine thing to do. Fair enough? All right. So what you can do, I'm going to start out with the, uh, with the big things. And the what you can do is not focused on become a person just like me or, uh, or Yuri. If you'd like to do that, we're happy to mentor you and, and bring you uh, into the fold. But what can you do without devoting your entire life to a Python core developer? Is there a way to participate without diving off the deep end into the water and uh, spending all of your spare waking hours working on the core? There are things uh, that you can do. I've tried to curate a couple of those for you, and I will continue to curate them. And I think I'm going to make a place on the net where I will continue to post things that people can do that would be immediately uh, uh, useful. So here's something that I am very interested in that I believe almost none of my other core developers are interested in. I shouldn't say that they're not interested in better error messages. Everyone would like to have good error message. I mean, not interested in it as in that's not where they're spending their time. They're working on asynchronous I.O. and uh, optimizations. And I say they, uh, that, that they includes me as uh, uh, well. We have things that we enjoy doing. But we're not as affected by as uh, bad error messages as you are. When you get a bad error message, you're not as familiar with the internals. You don't necessarily know what to do about the problem. It slows down your team. It impairs the usability of uh, Python. Often these error messages have 
happen when you're using Python in some uh, odd way that we hadn't anticipated. So the core developers don't even bump into these uh, error messages. I'll show you an error message in a moment that I had never seen before until last night when I was uh, working on an obscure uh, uh, patch. So uh, I think especially as a Python teacher, I see the impact of bad error messages all the time. And I believe that when you learn a new programming language, one of your first steps is, whenever I see this message, here's was what the actual root cause was. And over time, you form these associations, and that improves your ability to code in uh, uh, any language. What I'd like to do is help you bridge that gap. So what I really hate is messages that says, cannot do X. I'm like, can't or won't? You refuse. I am the human, you're the computer, you must obey. I cannot do it. I will not do it. No. I hate error messages like that. What would be better is cannot do X because some condition Y exists. That is a dramatically error, uh, better error message. Uh, it is not just in Python that we have these problems. I'm an extensive Photoshop user, and one of the interesting things in Photoshop is it's easy to get in some mode where many menu choices become grayed out. You don't know what caused that. All you know is that a menu choice that you want to get to won't turn on anymore. And so a uh, recommendation I made to the Adobe team is anytime you have an event that causes a box to bray out, you should have a subscriber uh, have that uh, grayed out box subscribe back to the cause so that when a person hovers over it, it said this box got grayed out when you did this action, which would help a person figure out how to turn it back on. So even better than that would be Cannot do X because condition Y exists that was often caused by Z. And it can be fixed by you do this. Do you think that would help people uh, quite a bit in their usability for Python? Be on the alert for these. When you see crummy error messages, think up a better one. Think it through a lot. Shallow submissions don't help us very much. And if you think it through, try it out on other people, post it up on the tracker, someone like me or uh, a Sir Hay or uh, Brett will come along sometimes within hours and we'll, uh, I'll post it, sometimes uh, a lot longer. Uh, so here's an example. Uh, particularly when I'm teaching uh, beginners, they say, they'll they raise up their hand and say, it's broken. I'm like, I have no, idea, uh, no doubt that it's broken. The machine is refusing to bend to your will. It says import error. Now, what I'm able to teach early on is import errors have a cause. The cause is the thing you tried to import wasn't accessible on the path. Either you spelled it wrong, there's a case sensitivity uh, issue, or you've put it someplace that is uh, not on a sys path. And so that's something I can teach. But why should I have to uh, teach that? It is a principle of API design that the knowledge of how to use a thing should be built into the thing. It should come back, say, import error. I can't import this module because it's not on the path spelled the way that you spelled it. Even that would be a dramatically better error message, and that is a patch that if were you to submit, I'd probably accept it uh, uh, tomorrow, unless I'm oversimplifying this particular uh, problem. Here is a suggestion for a project that I think would be very helpful in the Python world. What if we had a function called hint? And what Hint did is, just like in PDB, you can take the most recent exception and bring it back to life and go debug through it and do a post-mortem analysis. What if we had something that said Hint, where when you had an exception, Hint would be a function that takes the last exception and tries to analyze it and suggest what to do about it. Here's an example. Import uh, TK Enter. It comes back and tells you module not found, no module named TK enter. How many of you have ever seen a message like that? It comes up quite a bit. What's the cause of it? The cause of it is it got renamed in Python 3 to be a, a lower case. If you're typing an example out of the book and the book has uh, the Python 2.7 code in it, there is nothing to help you out here. Uh, there is nothing to tell you the right tool. How about we write a uh, hint? And what hint will do is, given that there's a module not found error, it can explore the path, much as IPython does, find everything that is importable, check uh, for a nearest neighbor match on the uh, name, and says, did you mean import TK enter? And if it can't find something, it would say, the hint would come back and tell you, here is the current path, all the places I looked. Would you like me to explore for you? And 
uh, further for you and tell you what PY path, uh, files are on that path. My suggestion to you is you create a module by that name and drop it into the current directory. That's the easiest way to get it to run. Uh, maybe it can figure out that when you import element tree and you get exactly this error, it'll come back and say, I believe that you meant the uh, element tree that is in xml.etree element tree. Did you mean to do a package import? And in the absence of that, a person will have to figure out what the path is in order to go there. I think this is a fantastic project to build. We've got lots of good machine learning tools out there. We could possibly crowdsource this thing. And that is a tool that one of you could build or a group of you can build. It'd be a fantastic project. It improved Python quite a bit. I don't know of any of the other uh, core developers who are actively working in this area. If you did something like this, you might change the world. You might be up here next year talking about, I invented Hint. Any questions on how Hint works? And then people will complain, Hint didn't help me in this situation, in which case you'll take their feature request. You said, once I needed a Hint and it wasn't helpful. You're like, yeah, all right. <laughs> Here's the one I learned about last night. I had no idea that you uh, could delete non-local variables. I should have thought, of, uh, thought that was possible because it's possible to delete locals. I mean, no one ever does, but you can. So uh, when working on the opcode for this uh, last night, I got an interesting message. Unbound local error, local variable x reference before assignment. What's interesting about that is this variable does exist and was assigned already. It exists up here before I do. this error message is actually wrong. The cause of the problem is the variable uh, was assigned, but then it got uh, deleted and actually got removed downstream. Almost certainly the cause of this is that the person who wrote this error message didn't anticipate this use case. The normal time that we uh, it occurs is when the X hasn't been defined at all, in which case the error message is right. So when you encounter one of these, you'll realize that the person who wrote the error message didn't anticipate this other cause. An improvement would be to say, local X was referenced uh, before assignment, R got deleted subsequent to uh, assignment. Look for Adele, and it's telling you uh, what you uh, need to do. Multiply these little hints times thousands of those messages in Python, and you've improved the language quite a bit. I've started checking some in this year uh, based on problems that my learners have in uh, uh, class. One of them was, uh, you get this message, expected a buffer object. There are plenty of experienced Python developers who have no idea what a buffered object is, in part because it is a C API concept and not an external API concept. The thing is, the message is technically correct, and so it can't be changed in that way. So I modified it, saying, expected a buffer object such as a string. You're like, oh, I gave it a number and not a string. And uh, probably I could modify it and say, expected a buffer object such as a string instead of the integer that you gave me because an integer doesn't make sense in this context. Do you think that'd be more helpful? You can do this. All of you can do this. You use Python all the time. When Python tells you lies, when it's not helpful to you, write down what the cause is. Post it, and uh, uh, let's go fix it. All right, something else that I think we really need that pretty much no one is working on. I shouldn't say no one. Uh, uh, one of the core devs, uh, Serhey, has taken, there was probably about 20 feature requests for uh, pprint, and he has done probably about half of those, putting them in. But in fact, everything he is doing is patching up something that was, I'm not going to say of terrible design. Uh, I should frame it properly. Pprint was made a long, long, long time ago when the world was a much, much, much simpler uh, place. We had many, many, many fewer uh, users. And somebody put together a little weekend hack to uh, pretty print Python uh, core objects. And it was thrown in as a quick and dirty tool. And it turns out lots of us started using it and coming to depend on it. So when Python, uh, when I added the set object to Python, pprint didn't know about it. It couldn't pretty print sets. Then it couldn't print uh, uh, frozen sets. Then it couldn't pretty print uh, default dicks. When name tuples came along, it had no idea what to do with them. And so we started patching it, and now it's turned into this gnarly monster. What does it need? It needs a complete re redesign. Do you have to start from scratch? No, it's wonderful. We live in a 
big, wonderful world of open source, you can scan other projects and other languages, and they all have pretty printers. And some people have done it right. Find one, and we will steal it. <laughs> Steve Jobs said, good artists copy, great artists steal. You know the best thing about that quote? He stole it. <laughs> all right. So, uh... I think this is a worthy project. If you have decent Python core uh, programming, uh, py just regular Python skills, you can work on this project. And it's an important project. It should probably have a lot of people involved. If you get it started and lay out a core design, we can set up a special interest group to uh, track it, other, uh, get other people involved, and make ourselves a nice pprint. pprint is so useful, I've long wanted to move it in and make it a, uh, a built-in function. However, the module itself is in such bad shape and is so embarrassing, it is not worthy of uh, being a built-in. If you work on this, you might be one of the handful of people in the world who has ever contributed a new built-in to Python. Fair enough. All right, that's uh, something else you can do. Uh, another case study, something easy, is uh, missing doc strings. In particular, where there is a C extension for a Python module, often the doc strings weren't copied over. Sometimes there were Python modules that have been around forever that didn't get uh, doc strings. So uh, when you open a URL, you get a uh, terribly named class called, I mentally misparse this, is I add in four, R, uh, four L's. Okay, that's not what it actually says. It's add info URL. So this thing was named back before underscores were invented. So I mentally misparsed it. And if you run help on it, it says, I have a method get code, get URL, and info. Do you have any idea what those do? There's docs in the documentation. You could look them up. How about, once you see something like this, submit a patch. It's not that difficult. This is pure Python code. Just add the lines. You can uh, cut and paste the documentation right out of uh, the docs. Why aren't the core developers doing uh, this right now? Well, we get so used to our tool, we're not even running help on, the, uh, on this uh, object anymore. We already know what's in it. This is not a problem uh, that we have. It's a problem you have. You should scratch an itch that is problems you have and other users like yourself have. Remember, my contention is that uh, core developers, our needs and knowledge are abnormal compared to the uh, rest of you, and so you have some needs not being met because we're not all like you. Uh, we, uh, in fact, a lot of you are here because you like Python. Well, I spend a lot of time as a core developer coding in C, making my needs uh, somewhat uh, different from yours. Element tree, here's what you get when you get help. It tells you the signature. It doesn't tell you what any of these things do, and some of them are quite uh, interesting. The decimal module, uh, one of my protégés is working on fixing this one up right now. Uh, uh, the threading module existed for 20 years without any doc strings. I went and put them in a few years ago into Python 2.7, but the API changed in Python 3, which means Python 3's threading module doesn't have doc strings. Now, this is non-trivial because you actually have to read the docs, understand what they mean, don't put in doc strings that lie to people. These actually have to be good. It means that you're going to have to understand the API. Uh, a theme of this talk is going to be if you contribute, what we really need is quality contributions. We get a lot of junk postings of, here, put this in. I believe this thing should be used in a different way. I'm doing something. I told the computer to do something insane, and it did something insane. Like, you told it to do that. So we get a lot of that. But if you put some thought into this and uh, make good uh, doc strings, that is a great place for you con to contribute. I've tried to curate things that I think need doing that aren't getting uh, uh, done. All right. Another thing that you can contribute that I think is very important is uh, critical thinking. We have some uh, core developers who are really, really good at making patches, but never learned some of the uh, software engineering skills that a lot of you know really well. Things like a module having uh, a loose coupling with other modules and high cohesion. We have a very prolific uh, contributor who doesn't seem to know that and is gradually cross-linking all of the modules together to make them mutually interdependent and breaking down internally the uh, module concept. You can help contribute to that line of thinking and help teach some of the core developers things that uh, uh, you know. You, there are 
It's something I'd heard one time that's really interesting. Regardless of how good you get at a topic, every person you meet has some knowledge that you don't. We can all learn from each other. You have things that you can teach Quido, that you can teach me, that you can uh, uh, teach to uh, Yuri, and that you can teach to Brett. So we'd like to find out what those things are, and you can bring it. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about critical thinking, and I hope you can carry this on to other projects as well. Uh, here's a case study. PEP 505 is non-aware operators. Look at this little thing right here, question and dot. This is not something that Python currently does. Right now, no other core developer I know is showing any interest in this PEP. Possibly, someone will come along and uh, say, oh, hey, I think this is a decent idea. And that'll be a person seconding the motion. It sat out there a long time. No one else has showed interest in it, which means there's no objections. Maybe Quido, in a moment of uh, weakness, uh, uh, decides to approve it. And poof, this will be into Python, whether it's a good idea or not. You can stop this from happening if it's bad, or you can help it happen if it's good. If it turns out it's a good idea, you can champion it. Uh, and what is necessary here to determine whether it's a good idea? Something that is hard for the core devs to do ourselves. Remember, our needs are quite different uh, from yours. What Quido needs for Dropbox is not the same as what most of, uh, of you need. Well, I shouldn't say that. There is a chunk of you to where your needs overlap uh, uh, with his. But in fact, his team codes quite differently, and they have very experienced engineers that they're, uh, they're working with. And yet we value the ability to bring uh, in Python people who don't have a deep depth of experience but want them to contribute it the right way. Uh, and, and we don't want them to have too high of a hurdle to get into. And so if you're a person who works side by side with Google engineers every day who all have PhDs, if we add new syntax to the language, the barrier for them is very little. That doesn't impair their abilities. But possibly it could cripple the abilities of everyday people for using Python if we put too much of this stuff in. This might be a good thing, or it might be a bad thing. You can help us figure it out. So this takes work. Take any large co existing Python code base, one that you have access to and familiar with, or something like Django, and work through it line by line. First, read this pep, work through an entire code base, and find, are there cases where this syntax would be helpful? If so, try it out and see if it fits. It is possible that this solution is unfit for the problem it's intended to solve. And that if you try it out in real world code instead of made up cases, you'll go, oh, it doesn't fit or work very well. That would be useful to know. Or you could try it out and say it does fit, but then I showed the code to other people and they had a hard time figuring out what this did. And I would show them the original code and they'd tell me the original code was better. That is a very useful uh, a data point. Or possibly, you can go apply this to this code base and says, wow, it's so much cleaner and more beautiful now. It runs faster. I completely get it. It's self-evident. And now we have a real-world case study of this is the right thing to do. If you show up in Python Dev tomorrow and say, I have reviewed, uh, gone through 25,000 lines of uh, Django. I found uh, that uh, one line in 100 would benefit uh, uh, from this. So there were 250 cases where it was useful. Here's several examples. And in those cases, it all improved readability, speed, efficiency. And then I tried it on some other Django people to say, could you understand this? And I think, yeah, that's pretty easy. If you showed up and could say that tomorrow, this PEP would be approved tomorrow and would be in in days. On the other hand, if you don't do this, this PEP is going to sit out there for a long time, even though the world possibly needs it. Or it could go the other way around. It might get approved, but with very little user input and make the language worse off. Are there ways that you can help? You do not have to be a uh, super experienced professional to do this. You just need to be willing to examine re real world code and determine, are we better off with this tool or not? I have some opinions about this, but they are initial reactions. Those initial reactions aren't good enough. Really, it needs to be grounded in, let's go try it out in real code and see if we're better off. Fair enough? Now, you guys are not all smiling. I've not gotten my tone right. I got too serious all of a sudden. Look at what you can do! <laughs>
you could grab code, go through and go, whoa, this thing is so cool. And you could go into Pi Dev and say, Quito, I have evidence. This is awesome. And he'd say, yeah, put it in. You could put your co-author the pep. You could be speaking about it on this stage next year. That could be you. Or maybe this is a terrible idea and you could be the one to save Python from adding an atrocity that we have to live with for generations. Your great, great grandchildren won't have to live with a dot question mark because you save them. You could be important. And I'm not kidding. All right. So uh, some case studies. A proposal was made to add to the random model, module the ability to make a choice, but a weighted choice. Uh, and it turns out that's expensive enough operation to where you don't really want to do one of them. You make uh, several weighted uh, uh, choices. So in American Roulette, you have 18 red, 18 uh, uh, black uh, uh, slots, and two green slots. So the weighting is 18, 18, and 2 across three choices, red, black, and uh, uh, green. Now I'd like 50 spins of the roulette wheel. We'd like to do that in one line of code. That concept is an easy concept. Most of you have encountered weighted probabilities in school, and I don't mean college either. I mean, a long time, by bet as my 12-year-old friend knows what a weighted choice is. Okay, and interestingly, the coding is not hard because I put a recipe in the docs several years ago to show exactly how to do this. If you read at the bottom of the random module docs, it tells you exactly what you need to do. So, is it a coding challenge to implement this? It's a simple question. True or false, you have a 50% chance of getting it right. Okay, I'll give you some hints. I've already given you the worked out solution in the docs, and it's a simple to easy to understand concept. Is this a coding challenge? No. If I uh, uh, told you the API gave you access to the example that I wrote in the docs showing how to do it, my bet is 95% of these people in this room could write it within 15 minutes. If you had some attention to quality, uh, you could write it with some uh, docs and some tests in another uh, few hours uh, after that. You'd go through a round of uh, code review and be ready to submit. Pretty easy. That's not what I want from you. It's not what I want from you. That is the easy part. It is so easy to slap a patch together for this. I put some effort into this, and I believe I'm coming up on about the 70, 80 hour mark in uh, investing time to work on uh, uh, this one. Why does it take that many hours for me to do something that you could do in 15 minutes? Do you have a hypothesis? The hard part is the API design. What's the correct name of the function? It took a lot of effort till I finally uh, realized that braided choices was the wrong name. The correct name is choices. And part of that came from I studied what other languages do. What did they do in R? What did they do in uh, NumPy? What did they do in uh, uh, Julia? We're not the first person, people to have ever had uh, this problem. The correct name is actually choices. Now, how many uh, uh, selections are you going to get? Well, I want uh, 15 weighted choices. What is that variable name? n, n equal 15, I'm going to make 15 of them. On the other hand, if you look at combinatoric theory, they'll say n things taken chosen r at a time. Maybe r is the right name. On the other hand, from machine learning, you know about k means. Maybe it should be k. Do you think any core developers know the right answer to that question? I don't think they do. They can guess at it. Who knows? People like you knew. So what I did was uh, I wrote to uh, Alan Downey, the uh, author of uh, uh, Think Bayes, Think DSP, Think Python. Uh, he's an applied mathematician, teaches Python at an engineering school, uh, teaches mathematics at an engineering school. This is a person who does math. And do you think he knows what the right variable names are? He writes journal articles. Sure, he'll know. I contacted uh, Jake Vanderplas, uh, well, another uh, Python superstar who does a lot of statistical work for Python. It's now with a university, but he specializes in uh, uh, doing uh, astrophysics uh, with Python. And he uh, gave a really great talk on doing random sampling with Python. Do you think he might know what the correct variable name is? Doing some research into some journal articles. So I consulted experts who are not everyday Python core developers. I didn't figure out this design. I contacted the people who knew. And you know what? That doesn't have to be me. 
You could have done this. You could have figured out who the experts are, sent them to notes. I got a book on uh, doing resampling, uh, which is a really wonderful way to do statistics a lot easier than the way that most of you learned in uh, school. And it is gradually emerging as a preferred technique to do advanced uh, uh, statistics. And so I took uh, one of these books and I took this tool and started coding the exercises in the book using this tool. Do you think I found the rough edges pretty quickly? Yes, it turned out my initial uh, design was terrible. And it took a while to figure it out. What order do you put the arguments in? It turns out the cumulative weights need to be side by side uh, with the uh, regular weights. It turns out that the weights need to be side by side with the population. The original uh, uh, design concept said, submit a dictionary where the key is red and the value is 18, where the key is uh, black and the value is 18. Doesn't that seem like a reasonable way to represent weights? Sure seemed reasonable to me. But because I contacted users and talked with people like you, I learned, oh, when you're doing this for real, when you actually are not doing a toy textbook problem, you have long list of population and long list of weights. And almost invariably, you're using pandas and you're extracting two separate columns, in which case I learned that a dictionary was the wrong input form. I also learned that it was reasonably common to have non-hashable data types in the population, so a dictionary is entirely inappropriate. In other words, every initial design instinct I had for this was incorrect. What I did to design this, you could have done. Any one of you could have done. You contact users. You are a user yourself. The core developers basically don't have these skills. We have to go outside. Are you guys getting where I'm going with this? You have knowledge that we need. Don't just sit there and not give it to us. You're withholding from us. If Python 3 come, 6 comes out and there's a crap API inside, it's your fault for not giving us feedback. <laughs> you should be using the beta right now because there's still a chance to uh, fix all of the bad APIs. If Python sucks, it's your fault, not mine. I ask for your help. Okay? Even questions like, should it return an iterator or a list? Well, an iterator is more memory efficient, and we had a couple core developers pushing very hard for an iterator. Turns out, if you try any of uh, the examples in the resampling book, you learn that reiterators are really hard to use in this context because when you get an iterator back, you have to immediately run an iter tools I slice on it to chop off part of the data, turn it into a list before you can compute statistics on it. And so every example became harder. But the people who argued for this being an iterator weren't actually doing any real world use cases, so they had no way of knowing. Their instincts were 100% wrong. You all are actual users. You could have helped inform uh, this design. So here, let me teach you a little bit about the critical thinking, a thought that is near and dear to my heart that uh, more Python core developers should know. What is uh, better, to have 15 specific cases or one general case that covers them all? Correct answer, five bucks, <laughs> American dollars, <laughs> not loonies. All right, so uh, five bucks for that answer. Uh, so in fact, sometimes special uh, purpose tools are easier to use. On the other hand, if you have to learn 15 special purpose tools that are in the same form, it's actually better to make the generalization so that you have one thing to learn. And if you've got that one thing, when case number 16 comes along, the general purpose tool will apply. So in general, when we factor code, we're taking several specific things, forming a generalization and uh, doing code reuse. This makes code a lot better. So we know generalization is generally good. Hypergeneralization is bad, however. That's when you generalize past the point of, uh, of uh, good utility. So here's an example. This has existed for a very, very long time. With strings, you can uh, do a find, r find, index, or r index. And what that does is searches for a substring and tells you what position it's in. Many, many languages have a tool like that. That said, dating all the way back to, I think, Python 1.5.6, very far back in time, the arguments start and end were added. Why did start get there? The answer is it is a key use case for indexing to where you index to find uh, a, uh, a matching element, and then you want to start from there and then go search for the next one.
Without this start argument, it's impossible to use in a loop. How many of you understand now why uh, start is there? There's an important use case that it's served by it. When we put start, should we also put end? The answer is yes, because there's some use cases to where if this doesn't occur within the first 100 bytes, it's not going to occur at all. Uh, or before uh, this part of the string that has the protocol. It's, uh, and also, the slice notation has start and end, and it's very familiar to Python programmers. In fact, uh, where's Marietta? New protege? Oh, right there. She is working right now on fixing this doc string mentioning uh, that it uh, comes from start and end, uh, that they match the uh, slice notation, and she's make, uh, just made an improvement today to mention that the result is relative uh, to uh, position zero and not relative to the start. So she's improving uh, the documentation. You guys get why this is here? All right. So we know that this is good. It's been around a long time, and people like it. Now, we've got something called string starts with and ends with. Those uh, were technically unnecessary. When I started Python, we didn't have them. What did we use? If you wanted to know if a string started with HTTP, you did a slice of the first four characters and checked to see if that was equal to HTTP. The reason that these two things were born was people would do it wrong. They'd do a slice of four equal to HTTP. That's fine. Then someone would copy it down. The slice of four is equal to HTTPS. Now the length doesn't match, and it was a kind of a cut and paste error, and so now you've got something that would never match, and this was causing real bugs and real programs. It turned out we're trying to express a notion something starts with something else. What we like about this is one is it makes that error case go away, and two, it's very clear, even a person who knows nothing about Python, if you say, does the URL starts with HTTP, they can read that, and Python is a highly readable language. Does everybody understand why we have starts with and ends with? All right. Next step, is there something about these APIs that is not parallel? What do you see? I'm looking for critical thinking here. Engage the brain. I know it's the end of the day. Turn on your minds. You're smart people. It doesn't have a start and an end. So... You can be what I call a, a completer. A completer is a person who sees that we have started down a path somewhere because we know something is a good idea and we haven't gotten around to completing it. An example in Python 2.7 is you can use the with uh, statement with file objects. Pretty nice. But you can't use it with string IO. Why? Because we hadn't gotten to it yet by the time 2.7 came out. I wouldn't say so much it was forgotten. It's just we ran out of time, and it didn't happen until Python uh, 3. So if you were a completer, you'd recognize we started putting with statement support everywhere it made sense, and we missed a few. Knowing that, what should you do, uh, propose here? You should propose, ah, this made sense here. Now we have two other string methods where we can't tell them to start and end with. But that is a sucker play. The problem is we had legitimate use cases here. We knew what this was for, and these tools were unusable without it. On the other hand, you have to really stretch your imagination to figure out cases where, uh, where you're going to want to do a starts with, but on a string where you're not at the starting point. Go 50 characters out, then it starts with. And even if you could say that, would it be readable code? Oh, I want to know if it starts with uh, QRST at position 50. That doesn't even make a whole lot of sense. Perhaps a person's better off with a slice. Are you already a little dubious about that? But you're a completer. And as a completer, you say, we did it in one place. We have to do it in some place else. I have not looked up to see who did this, which will spare me from naming them here on tape. And so they did that, and they put in start and end. What is the cost to us of them having put this decision in? It turns out, as far as I can tell, not a single user has been uh, foolish enough to use this. What happens is they need to do a starts with at some location, they realize the slice notation is better, and they go back and use this. By the way, how do I know what users do? Used to be I used Google uh, code search when that went away. Now I use uh, a GitHub code search. I constantly go check to see how you use all of our tools. I know what's being used, what's not, and how you're using it. And so I know 
that this is hardly ever used. And the only, uh, typically the matches I find when I search for it are all test cases where people are re-implementing uh, some wrapper around this. Fair enough. So now we put a feature into Python that completes the pattern, but no one uses and probably no one should use. We've made code less compatible between versions. We've increased the uh, uh, learning curve. But what's the downside? After all, if you don't need this, just don't use it. They're optional arguments. No cost, right? So no one protested, even amongst the core developers who kind of thought, well, the use case for this is dubious, but I'm not going to fight it. And it takes a lot of effort to fight uh, against something. And it's no fun to be negative and to try and shoot down somebody's idea that they're enthusiastic about. So what happened later? What happened later is we get a legitimate feature request, a good feature request later. It says, I need to know if this string starts with HTTP, RHTPS, RFTP. I want to check for three things at a time. That's a legitimate use case. The wonderful thing that would have been nice to do is prefix one, comma, prefix two, comma, prefix three, comma, prefix four. However, those positional arguments are now taken by these two. There's no space for it. As a consequence of it, we have the double parentheses of you have to pass in the other ones as a tuple. Uh, people are going to figure this out as we start to implement typing. Uh, the type signature for this will be, now this takes a string or it takes a tuple of strings. And if we start doing that sort of thing all the time, this thing returns a string or none and can raise an exception or takes a string or a tuple of strings, uh, and this part's optional and this part's not, and suddenly we've taken a simple tool and made it uh, hard to use. I suggest that the cost of us having put this in was it precluded a good API later on. Fair enough. And so this is an example of hypergeneralization. We've got a number of those in the standard library. What was needed was critical thought. It is really nice to get involved in our uh, group and cheerlead and say, oh, I think this is a great idea. Let's put it in. It's easy to get caught up in a party of let's stick something new in. In part, it feels really good to have championed something getting into the language. But what we really need is some critical thought. And each time a proposal comes up like this, look at it, and you can participate in the bug tracker. When someone makes a feature request like this, you can recognize it as a possible hypergeneralization. You might have saved us by looking at this and say, you know, I think in the future, we'll probably want to go down a different path of putting in several different prefixes with one comma separated in. And had we known that, we would have never uh, made this mistake. Just by applying your thinking skills to a tracker item, can you help? Yeah, and you don't have to be a Python expert. You just need to have some decent sense of software design. And we could greatly benefit from that. All right, this was a, uh, something that recently went into uh, Python 3.6. Uh, the idea is with the uh, enum class, you would have to say red equal one, green equal two, blue equal uh, three. Wouldn't it be nice if they could automatically number themselves? By the way, the phrase wouldn't it be nice is almost always a hint that what about to be is proposed is a bad idea. Just saying. Okay. Now it gets backed up with, I have checked in other languages that have enums. Almost all of them have auto enumeration capabilities. Is that, uh, does that suggest that this is a valid use case? In fact, it does suggest it. Many languages have uh, put in some type of auto num. We know that they've got it. We know that it's useful for them. And we know that it will save you code. In particular, a problem it will save you is if you need to insert something between red and green, you don't want to have to go back and manually change the numbers for each one of them. Red equal one, green equal two. Oh, now I have to do green equal three uh, and blue equal four. Can you see the merits of the suggestion? Now I'm curious what else you see. What this is supposed to do is, or what it does do, is when you run this class, it creates a class called color, an enumeration type, to where if you put color.red, it will give you the value one. Easy enough? What do you guys think of the proposal? What about methods? What's up? What about methods? What about methods? Uh, enum is very anti-method uh, and forces you to subclass to uh, add methods. Uh, 
but they're in, uh, to support that concept was you could put in the word ignore and it would tell you that there are certain words that you could define that would d ignore during the uh, definition. This special case here of having to ignore things that are in the standard library is a hint that you are fighting the rest of uh, Python and doing something orthogonal to the language. It says, I don't fit in very neatly to the language. I'm going to have to make many exceptions from the outset. And this example was in the uh, docs. But... A mechanism was provided to overcome that problem, ignore, and in fact that is quite readable. So if you put a class method uh, in here, it won't auto enum that, and, but will actually allow you to enable uh, one of your uh, structure members' property. There's something else, more fundamental, and none of the people who worked on it could see it. Not a single other core developer saw it except me. What do you see? Here it is. Everywhere in Python that we make an assignment, we either have a keyword for it. The class keyword assigns a variable equal to that class. The def keyword makes an assignment equal to the name of a function. When you import, that keyword makes an assignment equal to the name of the module object. Those are the special case keywords. We also have an operator equal. And for if you, whenever you have an existing object and you want to make an assignment, you use equal, x equal 10. Fair enough. Have you seen any case in the Python world ever where you could type the variable x that hasn't been previously defined and it magically springs into uh, being where that is not a variable lookup, that is actually a variable assignment. This line is an assignment and not a lookup. Now are you starting to sense the problem with it? This will throw off every lint tool uh, in existence. It'll come down and say, this variable is not defined elsewhere because you're trying to do a lookup of red here. Everywhere else in a class syntax, if you mentioned uh, red by itself, that's a lookup, not an assignment. The only precedent for this is uh, doc strings that auto assign, that string itself auto assigns to a variable. But that's the value. In this case, it's assigning the key. This breaks every lint tool in existence. It breaks uh, PyCharm's ability to uh, uh, refactor. It is unusual looking. Everything that you've learned about programming languages, it fights with that. Do you get the uh, gist of what's the problem was with it? So this did go into Python 3.6, uh, and I managed to convince its proponents to see the weaknesses, and the problem was they wanted it so bad. They were willing to overlook its flaws. And I had to say, you're breaking all of our, not just our tools, you're actually breaking our concept of what an assignment is. You're now doing an assignment without a keyword and without an equal sign. Unprecedented in our language, it is no longer Python. It is a language, not Python. Anyway, this is something that you can participate in it and see. And I would like to defend the developers who uh, made this. They did the right thing by looking to see what other languages did. They did the right thing to see if there were valid use cases, and in fact, uh, there were. They thought out very carefully the engineering design of it, but they fell into a problem that I've fallen into uh, myself. When you get deeply into a proposal, when you've written your own PEP, something terrible happens. Lots of people come to challenge your PEP. Oh, this is, a, and they misunderstand you, and you have to correct. They didn't read it right or whatnot, and you have to set, their, uh, set them straight on what it was you were trying to do. Once in a while, they make a nitpick that you can go fix, and you iterate on your idea, and something happens to you along the way. The thing that happens is if you defend your idea enough, you come to believe your own bullshit. I believe it is psychologically impossible not to. I have been involved in peps where I had to defend them so hard, but by the end, I just thought, the world just can't function unless my pep is accepted. Unless my presidential candidate wins, I'm moving to Canada. You know how it goes. <laughs> and when you get deeply in a project, it warps your worldview such that you can no longer imagine a world without your uh, proposal having been accepted as you meant it, which means that it is intrinsic in human thinking to totally lose perspective when you get too deep into a pep. Meaning that the two people who worked on this, who were champions of it, were so lost in it that it would be impossible, I believe, for them to have seen this themselves. So, do we need some external correcting force? Yes, where is it? It's sitting in a bunch of red chairs in this room. 
All right, I'm telling you what you can do. You can turn your brains on. It is possible for you to see what is wrong with this thing and to help us out. Okay, math.tau. Tau is equal to 2 pi. A fellow a few years ago made a proposal. Uh, he recognized a pattern that in many, many mathematical formulas and formulas in physics, 2 pi occurs quite a bit. Were he to substitute a new variable, tau equal to 2 pi, many, many physics uh, formulas and many math formulas become simpler, uh, conceptually simpler and easily more easy to uh, algebraically uh, uh, manipulate. He wrote a manifesto on this with lots of detail. It got uh, pinged around on Hacker News and shared amongst uh, uh, lots of uh, uh, people. And so uh, I believe it was Nick Coughlin who made the proposal to add this. Now, this isn't the first crazy thing Nick has proposed. On the other hand, Nick proposes lots of really good ideas. So the fact that he proposed it doesn't tell you right away whether it's good or bad. Uh, Nick is a person who will propose something crazy and then later a few months later take it back. Oh, I didn't mean that. I was, I was on crack uh, that day. All right. And so you, ca you can count on him to self-correct. So knowing that it came from Nick tells you it's serious enough for a core developer to make a pep to propose putting it in. What is it I want from you? I believe that if you were a decent, critical thinking, smart human being, it was your job to fiercely oppose this. Why? Well, none of the core uh, developers are mathematicians. But if you go talk to an actual mathematician, they will tell you that they never use tau. Basically never. None of the core developers are physicists or none of the active core developers are physicists. If you go talk to a real physicist, and I did, they don't use it. I took code that had 2 pi in it, and I substituted tau. I teach a lot of engineers, not kids, but uh, high school or whatnot, but actual professional working engineers like yourself, and I put code in front of them that uh, had tau in it and asked if they could tell what it did. And then they all were like, what is tau? which told me one they didn't use it two next i explained it to them what it is and later in the week i showed them the same code and say uh what does this do and they had already forgotten is this an indication that it's a problem okay i believe you all could have contributed from your fields to say is tau used or not is this considered a crackpot idea or a good idea and so what i would expect from you is to step up to the plate and universally just say, from my corner of the world, this looks like a crackpot idea. The person who proposed it originally wasn't even intending it seriously. It was kind of an April Fool's joke when it uh, got started. Everybody understand what I'm expecting of you? But I expect something else. This got a new champion other than Nick Coughlin. His initials are GVR. Quido Van Rossum. And he said, let's put it in. I've got a question for you. He doesn't have time to put it in himself. He's an important man. It's tough to be a benevolent dictator for life. So people have to do it for him. Are you going to volunteer your time to put this in? You should. Absolutely. Should you support him on this? Absolutely. It is my belief that we should all give Quito the feedback he needs to make a correct decision. But once he made his decision, many decisions that he made that I've opposed, the moment he made the decision... I have to switch sides and come defend his point of view and just say, this is what we're doing. It's decided. The discussion is uh, over. If you ever participate in Python ideas, you'll know that this doesn't work in that forum. Quido will say, there's no way we're doing this. And then another thousand emails will go talking about all the variations of ways to do it, knowing that it's never going to happen. So I believe you should switch sides. I also believe you should know why it's there or why I believe it's there. I think there's something exciting about this. If this had gone into Python 15 years ago, people would look at it and say, this is a crackpot, something crackpot. But Python is popular now. It is influential. It is possible that I was considering, do engineers currently use Tau? The answer is no. Well, possibly somebody has to be first. And if that somebody is Python, Python has been a thought leader many times. List comprehensions was something we didn't do first, but we made it very, very popular. And as soon as we did, uh, and uh, or not list comprehensions, I'm sorry, uh, generators, it propagated to other languages just like that. Possibly Quido's decision to put this in may change the world. Python's out for a while, 
Other languages put it in. Mathematicians start using it. It starts appearing in textbooks. And so we don't have to be on the tail end of the whip. We can be the one swinging the whip. But in general, my recommendation as a critical thinker is you should have given Quido the input that said, this is probably a crackpot idea. Nobody in my part of the world uses it or believes we would benefit from it. I've tried it out in real code and it doesn't rate the code better. My team tried it out and we coped with it by doing from math import tau as to pi to explain what it did. That would have been useful feedback. But then if he decides to be a thought leader, then your goal as a person contributing behind it is to go convince other people that it's well, righteous, and true and teach them how to use it correctly. Who's learning something new? All right, I'm giving you ways to think about problems, ways to contribute. Assert is close. The idea is in unit test, uh, we have a lot of assertions. Assert uh, less than, uh, assert that one thing is a subset of uh, another. And in mathematics, when you're doing floating point computations, you often suffer a little bit of some round off error. So you'd like to know if your answer is not exactly equal to some other answer, but in a test, is it close to it? Like, you know, the computation is supposed to give you pi. Well, does it give you exactly pi or pi out to six decimal places? You guys got the use case? And if you are a floating point number person, you might want something uh, like that. What do you think about it? What's that? That's exactly it. I've got a question for you. Is our son close to Alpha Centauri? Relative to the Milky Way, yes. Relative to Earth, no. Relative to our capabilities of traveling, not close at all. Close is your next door neighbor's house. So close is in fact relative to something, and now you've got a test telling you something is close where you haven't defined what close is meant. Do you see a, a problem? But there's another more subtle problem here that I'd like to teach you to view with API design. Something that the person who created this can't see. The person who created this is trying to solve a problem. They want to know if two things are close to each other. So they already know what they want it to do. But a reader of this code doesn't know in advance what you wanted to do, and they have to interpret it from these words. By the way, uh, is this file closed or is it open? The, uh, once you take out math.py here, if you put the variable f here, is that checking for a closed file? or is closed, or uh, whatnot. Uh, is it a closed operation? It can be read in another way. This is a subtlety, but at least, uh, particularly in test cases, you need your test to be frighteningly clear. Because if your test is telling something's okay when it's not, it's lying to you, and that leads to uh, real world bugs. So uh, on this basis, I convinced the proponents of this uh, to withdraw the suggestion. I am tired of trying to convince proponents to uh, withdraw their uh, uh, suggestions. It is no fun to be that guy all the time. I want some help from people who are sitting in red chairs, in part because often I'm involved in something. I'm the person who can't see the truth because I'm so deeply involved in it, and I need somebody else to say, whoa, what the heck are you doing here? And uh, that would be useful. These are all ways that you can log into a bug tracker. You could have made the comment on this that would have caused this one to get closed. A little bit of note of uh, negativity. Some of participation in the bug tracker is fairly negative. If you want to have a positive life, join a project that is basically already approved. Join the Async I.O. project. It will ha continue to happen for a while, and the ideas you have in there will be put in code and accepted. Join the typing project. Be one of the first users of uh, uh, typing, and you can contribute in a fairly uh, big way. On the other hand, if you go out to the bug tracker and start to uh, 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 triage request, remember that there's Sturgeon's law. 90% of everything is poop. And, the, uh, and that's when the project is new. But Python is 26 years old. Often, if something's not in the language now, it's because for 26 years, no one needed it. Or because we evaluate, took it out because it was a bad idea at that point. So possibly 99% of the ideas we see on the tracker are things that we shouldn't do. Every day, Benjamin is closing down one of uh, those requests. Every day, sir, he is closing down. Every day, I have to go tell somebody no to their idea that makes perfect sense to them and just go, 
I understand from your point of view, you think this makes things better, but in fact, it, uh, it makes things worse. Uh, by the way, the easiest way out of this is if you can find some email in the past where Quito said, there's no way we're ever doing this. That way you can say, oh, I would have accepted your idea because I'm a nice person, but that damn Quito. Uh, and that's always the easiest way to close them down. So there is some negativity involved in it. I'd like you to also try and turn it into a positive. And that I've come to believe that inside almost every bad idea, somewhere there was something good. So people make a suggestion for a change to the documentation and their suggestion is wrong or reflects a perverse worldview of some sort. But inside it, it tells us that they misunderstood the tool, which tells us that the existing documentation is not helpful in some way. And out of uh, their ill-formed feature request, we can elicit something good. So if you would like to be a force for good on uh, the uh, bug tracker, find the crummy ideas and see if you can find their good little nugget of truth that's inside. That will help the person who made the suggestion grow and if they don't get rejected, if their idea gets turned into something good, they may turn into a core developer uh, someday themselves. Uh, I really worry that a lot of people submit crummy ideas, we say no to them, and it turns them off of open source contribution uh, entirely. Much like on, if you go on Wikipedia and you edit a few articles and immediately your edits get reverted, you stop making contributions to Wikipedia. Fair enough. It would be much better if people came along and said, well, we should actually change your edit because this doesn't buy, uh, follow our policy in this way, or you could have better annotated in that way, nurturing uh, people along. Fair enough? All right. Uh, string format. How many of you have ever seen printf before? How many of you have uh, seen format? What is non-harmonious about these two? The person who made format wasn't working on format at the time. That person was solving another problem. What are all the format strings? What's the dunder methods? Uh, how do we get uh, operator support for it? They were in the midst of hard problems. And putting format up was the easy problem, which meant there was probably zero thought into which of these should go first, the format spec and the value. Those of you who have a background in functional languages know that a common technique is to partial functions. Which would you uh, most likely want to partial? The answer is almost always the format spec. I want to take something that says always format to eight uh, decimal places, partial it, and then apply that to a series of values. So as design, this is very difficult to use with map uh, and uh, inside uh, uh, list comprehensions. And when would you ever format a value without supplying a spec, having that an optional argument? This is a terrible API. Not harmful, just not great. But once an API is released, we can never, ever, ever change this. You could have stopped this. In fact, just a moment's thought by any of you could have uh, saved us uh, by this. I didn't look at it. Yuri didn't look at it. Brett didn't look at it. We just heard, hey, format went in. We knew we wanted a format. We didn't look at the argument signature. Nobody gave it a second thought. There were test cases. There was documentation. It just happened to be really bad API design. All right. You've got some Booleans, A, R, B uh, returns true, A and B uh, uh, returns uh, uh, false. So two Booleans go in, one Boolean comes out. These are bitwise operation, which raises the question, what should not A do? Currently, it returns minus two. Why? Well, it's a subclass of integer, and if it hasn't been told to behave otherwise, it does what integers do. Why did this happen? The answer is the person who made this had no concept that anybody would ever even do this. Yet it is not hard, that hard for you when we make a new API or a new class to go check each of the methods and try it out and see what it does and ask yourself, does this make a lick of sense? You could have early on, with five minutes of experimentation, found this and just said, hey, Boolean, Boolean integer. One of these is not like the other. Hello, wake up. And we would have gone, ooh, you're right. That would be easy for you to find. You can do this, and you don't have to be deeply skilled in C or anything like that to do it. You just try out APIs, plan, turn on your brain, and think. Statistics that mean. So how many of you have used the statistics module? It's kind of cool. Mean, medium, node, variance, whatnot. Who doesn't need those? In fact, you get involved in machine learning or any type of data analytics. This is something you want. Which raises the question when we're designing it, what does a user want from mean? What do you want from it? Here's our problem. Core developers aren't normal people with normal problems. 
In fact, the person writing this probably never computes means. They're very interested in writing Python and said, I know how to compute a mean, take the sum divided by the average. And so I can write this tool. And then it evolved into something insanely uh, complicated. Internally, in order to get greater precision than sum, it could have used math.fsum. That would have gotten you accurate to within one unit in the last place. But no, that would be too easy because it's only one line of code. I know what you're thinking. There must be a worse way. There is a worse way. Why not uh, mentally reject our math.fsum and invent your own sum that is absolutely perfect all the way out to the last decimal place by converting every one of the inputs to a fraction, doing rational arithmetic to add them up together? What's the problem with this? The problem is uh, uh, how quickly it runs. So what are the actual user use cases? One is you want mean daily temperature. When I go run it on this, my question, uh, the good news is it works. My question is, when you're doing something like this, averaging the daily temperature, how much precision is in these measurements? You might say down to one decimal place, but there's no point ones or point sevens in there, so it's to within a uh, uh, half a degree. So do you need a mean that's going to compute out to uh, the 53rd bit of accuracy for the mean? No, so we put in a feature that you don't need. No person using, trying to do descriptive statistics ever cares about the 17th decimal place. They're care looking at the first uh, couple. In fact, typically out to three decimal places, mean is completely useful, useless as a descriptive statistic. So did we put in a feature that you didn't need? Okay. Now, what else might you do with it? Well, we have a, a, a little test of a drug. By the way, this is a real example. Uh, so this is from an actual medical study. And uh, you get placebos, you get these measurements, you get the uh, drug, and you get these measurements. And you'd like to know the difference in the means between these two. What is the 90% confidence interval? Like, does this drug actually make you better off most of the time? Is that a reasonable question to ask? That is an actual real user scientific question that is within the capabilities of at least half of the people in the room. The technique for doing this is called bootstrapping. In bootstrapping, you make many choices out of the original population. It's called resampling. And so you resample the population. We get the original observed difference, and we make 10,000 trials. Compute the mean of a bootstrap sample of the drug in placebo over and over again, trying different mean differences between the two, and count how many uh, uh, match. Uh, uh, so after we sort them, the difference is below 500 and above 9,500. Uh, th these give you the confidence interval. How many times am I looping here? 10,000. That's normally the minimum for bootstrapping. Very common to go out to 100,000. How many elements are in our drug and placebo? I picked this one because it's a textbook example and a real use case and because it was easy to fit on a slide. But the recommendation for bootstrapping is bootstrapping should only be applied to sample sizes of 100 or greater. Which means in a typical use case, it, what is the confidence interval for uh, uh, the difference in means between these two populations? You have to run 100,000 times across 100 elements plus another 100 elements. So 200 times 100,000 uh, uh, steps. Do you think it's going to matter to you whether mean is fast or not? An actual real user, which was not the person who wrote this thing, that person is just like me, I'm just a programmer. He's like, told me to write a mean, I wrote you a mean. I gave you a perfect mean. One that's accurate to the 17th decimal place. You should love me. You do love me, right? Oh, not that button. You don't love me anymore. So I ran some quick timings on it uh, uh, for these slides. And it's over 100 times slower than uh, uh, some versus lane. Basically crippling your ability to do bootstrap. And meaning this tool is no longer fit for its intended purpose. It's perfectly accurate, a feature that's something that no one wants. And I'm not blaming the person who wrote this. They didn't do anything wrong. They tried to make as perfect a mean for you as they could. What they lacked was contact from people sitting in these red chairs. 
If you told them what you actually did with means, the volumes of data that you work with, that bootstrapping is very common in uh, resampling and is a, uh, becoming a preferred technique in statistics. If you do Bayesian analysis, you do this all the time, all day long, a lot of iterations. And this being 100 uh, times slower uh, uh, causes you to not use the tool that's in the standard library. And so a fairly common question that I've got when I uh, raise this issue is, is something that just really worries me. Can I monkey patch this back in to the statistics module? I'm like, oh. If we're having to take a tool that we provided you and monkey patch it back, that means that we did a terrible job. And who do I blame? The person I made this or the people sitting in the red chairs who didn't chime in to tell us what a bad idea this was? Okay, you got the idea. Uh, hold on. Let me go uh, quickly here. Some advice for participation in the uh, core project. We're getting out of uh, code here, and I aim to wrap up in about uh, uh, 10 minutes, in case you're wondering if, whether you were ever going to get to eat. Are you ready? Lessons from uh, Python core developer world. One. If you start to enter our world, make sure that you are anchored. Our world will buffet you around and cause you to think weird thoughts after a while, unless you are anchored. It will push you in interesting directions, and suddenly you will see all problems as async I.O. problems, and you'll be doing stuff, uh, yield coroutines in your sleep, and you'll think that's the way of the world, unless you're grounded in reality. How should you ground yourself? Step one, before you step into our world, is write down for yourself. Why is Python so successful? What do you like about it? Write that down. You, did you like it because you could learn the core of it in one day? Did you like it because you can read other people's code? Think, uh, did you like it because of the range of uh, batteries that are in, uh, installed? And then commit yourself to making sure those things remain true. If you loved Python because you could learn the core of it in a couple of days, well then maybe you shouldn't be the core developer to every week pro uh, propose a brand new feature because it doesn't take long before that becomes bigger than a person can reasonably uh, uh, learn. If you uh, love that Python had a lot of batteries, how about you don't become the person who uh, suggests deprecating everything in the standard uh, uh, library? We should take that out and push it out to a uh, Python package index. I'm not saying that that is a correct thing or an incorrect thing. I'm saying before you come to our world and we warp your thinking, decide what you like, and then make sure Python stays that way. This is the most important piece of advice I can give for contributing to any open source project. Before you get thrown off your center, say, why do I like NumPy? Why do I like Julia? Why do I like the iter tools module? And once you know what that is, then commit yourself to not screwing that up and helping other people stay on that track. <sighs> Wrong button. The currency of Python core developers. What do we have to spend? We're all volunteers. Our currency is time. I have less of it. I'm married. I have a son. I like to uh, put him to bed every night. And after I've done that, I like to spend some time with my uh, uh, wife. And then she goes to bed and I uh, get an hour of two of core development each night. So how much uh, does the world get of me now? The Python core team gets about 10 hours a week, unless I'm having a night where I can't sleep, in which case they get 20. Suppose you come to uh, Python dev and get really chatty, and suddenly the volume of emails goes up by a factor of five. This happened about a year ago with one new developer who was just very chatty, who wrote more emails, I did account for the year, than myself, Quido, Brett, and the, uh, Antoine, and the top five core developers combined. And the effect of this is it made that channel unusable for me. This is a nice person, don't get me wrong, very chatty, happy, nice, made it a pleasant place to be, but made the channel unusable because instead of me uh, spending 10 minutes a night reading uh, Python uh, dev, and then taking half an hour to reply to an email, suddenly, with five times the volume, I couldn't do it anymore, and I substantially dropped out of participation in that mail list. It was destroyed. If you want to wreck Python, an easy way is to eat up core developers' uh, time. Uh, if you spew out a bunch of random patches that aren't good, it takes time for us to go evaluate them, talk back with you, coach you uh, through it. And in the time that we do that, we lost the time that I was going to go spent to go to the collections module and add uh, slicing, for example. When someone takes a module that I've written that has been stable for 15 years with happy users and says, I'm going to rewrite everything inside and refactor it. 
I can't ignore that person because they're about to submit a big patch. Possibly they're going to work for a long time on it. And if I don't participate in it, possibly something that was in great shape is about to become bad. Or possibly they've got a really good idea. Either way, I'm about to lose my next month of core development time. When someone decides they rewrite a module that I've uh, on, worked on, I now that has to go to the top of my stack, and I can't do any of the other things I'm going to do. So how does it relate to you? The Python world is so big, Quido cannot keep up with what's in it. Most of you, almost every person in this room, knows some package that you like that Quido has never used. Almost every single person in, in, in here. There are parts of the, the language is so big that I learned last night a part of the language that I had never seen before. I was talking with Yuri uh, uh, earlier. Uh, important Python developer, knows lots of the internals, and there are things that are in the tutorial that he didn't know was in the language. It is so big, no one person knows everything that's in the language. The consequence for you is decide how much time you want to put in. Set a budget for yourself and decide how you want to allocate it. I can no longer do the things I used to do. I used to read every tracker item, every check-in, monitor the IRC channel, uh, deal with you now a few years we changed our, uh, our tooling. Uh, I wrote my own code, wrote documentation, coached new devs. I'm spending a lot of time doing coaching now uh, uh, for our uh, uh, new devs. And some of these have to go, which means I'm completely missing interesting discussions on Python dev. I completely miss the ability to answer your questions on IRC. But so when you come, realize that this is your currency, you have a finite amount of time, and don't try and do it all. Fair enough? Brett, do you have enough time to do everything in the Python core world? Heck no. How about yourself, Yuri? How about Quido? Heck no. And so uh, pick a part of the world that is a part of the garden that's not being well attended, Devote yourself to it and say, I'm going to take this part of the garden and give it two or three hours a week or 10 hours a week or however you want to put in and say, I will tend that part of the garden. And we'll say, hey, welcome to uh, uh, the team. On the other hand, if you step in and eat up all of the few hours that we have available that I stole from my wife and my child, I will growl at you. All right. Be a good neighbor. Don't step on other people's flower gardens. Uh, what I mean by that is some parts of the language are beautiful. They are exquisitely crafted. I hate to mention date time here, but Tim Peters and Quido spent several days at a whiteboard working out the design of date time. They thought out a lot of issues. The odds are the first idea that pops into your mind to change date time is something that they ruled out 15 years ago. But now they no longer have time to tend to that garden. It's actually easy to mech this, this one up. Uh, I talked about assertions before. Here's one that happened to me. We recommend holistic refactoring. Rather, occasionally a person says, I see an improvement in the library. Now I'm going to go through the entire library and change it everywhere. The problem is you're going in to change it into uh, places that you're not that familiar with, and you don't really know what the original core dev was trying to do. And so you're not factoring holistically. So Quido recommends why don't we save those little niggling changes, white space changes, variable names, other types of refactoring, for when someone's actually working on that module, thinking about it as a whole at the time. So here's an example. Uh, a long time ago, I wrote set objects, and I wrote a test. Self-assert true, less A than B. Easy enough? All right. At the time, the unit test module did not have self-assert less than, which is a more specific assert. And the intention is that when this fails, it will give a better error message. The error message that self-assert true gives is someone asserted true and it's actually false. That tells you nothing about the data. Can you see why the second one is better than the first one? Okay, so one of our core devs went through the entire library making uh, uh, these changes. The problem is they hit my sets module and they changed this, uh, this one to this. It's still there uh, even right now. I haven't uh, uh, changed it back. It's kind of rude to undo uh, other core developers' uh, contributions. But what this thing was originally testing was it wasn't testing less than. And sets less than means a subset operation. Further, I had already tested subset operations. This was not a, even a test of subset. I knew that A was less than B, uh, subset of B. I was testing the operator to make sure that it worked. So now it's been changed to this. Less than is not the concept, it's subset, and I don't know for sure 
that someone's not going to change the internal code to that to where it gives me the negative of the greater than, in which case it will stop testing the thing it originally tested. So this is a consequence of not doing holistic refactoring, and it's a reason why we don't want you to sweep through the Tanner library and say, I went and changed all of your tests. I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> all right. I'll... Finding your own way. Let's see. Anything exciting here? No. Oh, this is a big one. Assume the people who came before you knew what they're doing. If you assume otherwise, many projects you go to, Everything you touch, you can improve because you were better than the people who came before and you have a little bit more time and you're more informed by use cases. But you come to uh, Python, that project's been around 26 years. So we have a person who made a very useful contribution recently to dictionaries. And it went in. That person now feels empowered to go just change everything in dictionaries and that they are making dozens of changes right now. The problem is, who designed that dictionary? Well, it was modeled on Nuth Algorithm D. Quido put it together. It was originally his code. Then Tim Peters came along and made it awesome. Then Friedrich Lund looks at it. And then Alex Martelli looks at it. Some of the greatest minds I've ever met has finally tuned that code. And they're not around to say that these changes that are going in right now, whether they make sense or not, and possibly an invariant is being unviolated, a reason that something is being done. You know, I, I learned early on, every time I changed, tried to change any code that Tim Peters wrote, I suddenly found out, oh, you just broke this obscure use case on a Solaris. What you didn't know is about this variant of IEEE 754, where subparagraph C, this, it's like, my God, you're smart. Well, Tim was there to tell me that. If he hadn't been there, I would have just jacked up his code and didn't know. So in the absence of Uncle Timmy being around, presume the people who came before you actually knew what they're doing. And don't just presume that they were uh, idiots. The code is uh, fairly good. Thinking uh, possibly, uh, positively, we talked about nurturing great ideas. Uh, this is uh, something that is important for our project that I don't think many core developers get. Adding more features does not necessarily make the language better. In general, in a language toolkit, the more tools you put in, the more choices you give users, the harder it is to use the uh, toolkit. Uh, so curb the enthusiasm on every idea that you've ever put in your utils directory now is to be, to be in the standard library. Anchoring. This is an important slide, particularly the last part. Regular open source projects know what it is they're trying to do. We don't. Because a open source language, the, some of the use cases for it haven't been invented yet. Things that are going to occur 10 years down the road, someone's going to code Python. We don't know necessarily what they're going to do with the language. So we have to, as much as possible, anchor ourselves in real world use cases, like the statistics module didn't do. And we have to resist the urge to be cute, and uh, focus on Timmy's advice. Here is the number one thing that you should keep in mind when evaluating Python uh, proposals. Our entire profession is about managing complexity. It is easy for us to make code that is more complex than we can debug. So the evaluation of every new feature is, is does this result in a net reduction of complexity or increase of complexity? Good news is it makes the line of this line of code shorter. Bad news is if you have to trace through it through a debugger, you'll never figure it out. That's a net increase in complexity. If it's a rarely used tool, the cost of learning it is greater than the benefit of using it only once every uh, five years. So each thing has to do with the complexity reduction. Do you remember that dot and question mark from earlier? How do you evaluate it? Go try it out on real code and then evaluate. Is the code more complex now or less complex? And that includes the debugging it, figuring out what the dot does, other users trying to read it, testing it, covering all the corner cases. Did it become easier or harder? I don't know the answer yet to that particular problem, but you can go figure that out. Uh, and, oh, I have to say this just as I want to defend unit tests. If you go touch a major module and alter its code, you could possibly mess up a lots of code that people that rely on. So what's the safest place to go touch? The test. What if you go to retactor the test? I'm going to suggest that there is a great deal of danger in doing so. When you refactor code that has tests, the tests are your safety net. 
when you refactor test, what is your safety net? You don't have one. In particular, if some of the tests were developed using test-driven development, they, ha they are a rare and special thing. They are tests that failed at one point, then we put in a piece of code that made it pass. Uh, there was a bug. We made the test fail, or it started failing, and then made it pass. We know that that's a really good test. If you go refactor it, you might turn it into a passing test, but it stops testing what it was uh, t uh, testing for. So I'd like to suggest that unit tests are sacred and resist the urge to uh, uh, refactor them in any project uh, because you never, it's so easy to miss what it was that it was uh, trying to test. Again, my set example is a case for that. Uh, I wanted to put up a quote from Kenneth Reese. It's actually from his book, Hitchhiker's Guide to uh, uh, Python. Uh, and then I just learned from him today, after I made this slide, he took the quote from someone else, so he didn't originally say it. But this is fantastic. Take it to heart. Uh, basically, it has to do with the management of complexity. Just because you know how to use a meta class and how to write one doesn't mean you need to throw a meta class at every problem. Fair enough? All right. The call to action and the close. Decide that this is something you want to participate in. You can give us five minutes a week looking at the bug tracker. You can uh, choose a little garden and go maintain it. You can take my suggestion list for projects. There's a lot of things you can do. Decide that this is something you want to do, because if you don't, and Python sucks next year, I'm going to blame you. We welcome you. We look forward to your participation. If you actually really want to be a real core developer, meaning devote all of your life to a job with no pay, let me know, and I will make sure that you get into a mentoring program, and we will uh, bring you aboard and welcome you. But you can participate at a few minutes a week. Thank you so much for inviting me to uh, uh, Canada. It was a delight to give this uh, policy talk. I'll do one question out loud, and it has to be from a lady. I modeled this on something Quito did at a conference, and it worked perfectly there. Do I have a single lady in the audience who has a single question? Uh, yes. Uh, it's not a question. I just want to thank you for the wonderful, wonderful presentation. Also very informative, very entertaining. She said she liked it. Thank you so much.